Hello and welcome everyone to How to Get Nutrients You Need on a Raw Food Diet. We are super excited to share with you today some important facts about a few of the nutrients most commonly asked of us, the minerals calcium, iron, and zinc, and omega-3 fats. We will also cover the hot topic of prebiotics and how they relate to probiotics. For those of you who don't know us yet, I'm Dr. Karen Dina. And I'm Dr. Rick Dina. We are known as the developers and instructors of the Science of Raw Food Nutrition series of classes we taught for 10 years at a raw culinary school in Northern California, and for making complex scientific concepts easily understandable to a general audience. We're also authors of the Raw Food Nutrition Handbook and the hosts of the Raw for Life Summit 2016 and the International Raw Food Summit 2017. We are also the developers and instructors of the Mastering Raw Food Nutrition online and interactive program. Before moving on, I do need to make it clear that the information and opinions expressed in this webinar are not intended to be used as medical advice and should not be used to diagnose or treat any medical condition or as a substitute for individual health care. This webinar is presented with the understanding that we are not liable for misconception, misuse, or adverse effects resulting from its use. Any type of dietary change, nutritional therapy, or fasting should always be undertaken with the supervision of a qualified healthcare practitioner. And it's possible if you work with us in the future that we may be those qualified healthcare practitioners, but we will make a thorough analysis, including lab work, of your situation and be able to guide you that way. That cannot happen from just watching a webinar passively. In our webinar today, we'll address some common misunderstandings about raw food nutrition in addition to our educational topics. That will be followed by some information about our Mastering Raw Food Nutrition online curriculum. When Dr. Karen and I got started on our raw food journeys 27 and 30 years ago respectively, there were far fewer resources available than there are today. Never before has there been such a time when so much raw food information is available with, unfortunately, such a small percentage of it actually being reliable. Due to the internet, access to information about raw food nutrition is easier than ever before. But is the internet really the easiest place to find accurate, useful information on raw food nutrition that will sustain your maximum health for a lifetime? We've heard over and over again from our students and our patients that the internet is a great place to go if you want to get confused. People on YouTube and social media often use raw food as a platform for drawing attention to themselves and for creating controversy. They know that creating controversy increases engagement and views, which gets them the attention they are seeking. But what does this do for your health? The point is, it's harder than ever to find reliable information on raw food. And that seems so ironic that in this time when information about raw food nutrition is more easily accessible than ever before, that the percentage of reliable quality information has never been lower. It's what I call the information age paradox, and it's likely to continue to only get worse from here. For example, we see headlines for programs where you can make a living in the alternative health field doing what you love. That sounds okay, but one of the major selling points is that you don't need to know anything at all about health in the first place. It's suggested you just look stuff up on the internet and then give your followers your spin on it. And if you don't know anything at all in the first place, how can your spin be qualified at all or be accurate? That same information just basically keeps going around and around and with unqualified opinions, and people are left more confused than ever. It's what I call the take and wake model. They take by getting your attention, but you're left in a wake of confusion, wanting to be healthy, 
but not really knowing how to go about it most effectively. This is what makes us and our approach really stand out. In our work, we break through the confusion and show you how to do that too. When I started out over 30 years ago, so many of these same confusing issues were as much a source of debate back then as they are today, except it all seems so amplified now due to the internet. We have spent so much time sifting through and weaving information from these different points of view into a workable whole that has made a huge difference in our health and for so many others that we have worked with over the years. Now, occasionally, some truly new information comes along, and as we're committed to being lifetime learners and we love what we do, we get excited about it and study it. The nice thing is that we have a solid foundation to put the new information into perspective that often even the advocates of the new information don't have. Even the best information isn't so useful if it can't be applied properly. Nevertheless, the foundation of the core issues are still there, and having a solid foundation which allows you to know how to navigate all the confusing information coming at you in today's choppy waters is priceless. We know how tough it can be when you're getting started. We were there too and had to make sense of the opposing viewpoints such as the high fruit approach versus the low fruit approach and new concepts like food combining and others. Consider this testimonial from a student who took our previous Science of Raw Food Nutrition curriculum, which lays the foundation for our new, updated, and expanded Mastering Raw Food Nutrition online curriculum that we'll tell you more about later on in this webinar. Denise from Calgary, Alberta, Canada says, There isn't a better course available designed to arm anyone desiring to improve the health of themselves and others, allowing them to weed through news reports, marketing, and research. Add on top of that a balanced, open approach, presented in an inspiring, yet modest manner. Having said that, I will let Dr. Karen share with you what got her started on her raw food path over 27 years ago. I found raw food at a time when I was experiencing notable fatigue for which there was apparently no answer. I was in college at the time and was sleeping 10, 12, and sometimes even more hours per night and still waking up non-refreshed. I saw three medical professionals and after multiple lab tests and evaluations, I had a diagnosis, fatigue of unknown origin. They had a whole list of everything that I didn't have, but could not pinpoint the source of my fatigue. I asked every single one of them if my fatigue may have had anything to do with my college diet and lifestyle. All of them emphatically said no. Things started to change, however, when a friend gave me a copy of a book that discussed vegan diets and the connection between diet and health. I also learned about the connections between diet and the environment, and the way animals are treated. With all of these compelling arguments, I was open to giving this approach a try, and I became vegan. In addition to feeling good about eating compassionately and leaving a lighter footprint on the earth, I was so excited to find that my fatigue actually started to improve, despite what the so-called experts, in this case the medical professionals, said would happen. This personal experience opened the door to my thinking that diet really could make a difference in health and left me open to exploring other opportunities. When I learned about and implemented a raw food diet, my energy soared far beyond impressive improvements I had experienced by eating vegan. In our three-part video series, I shared the story of my introduction to raw food. Long story short, my fatigue vanished along with a variety of other symptoms I'd had for years, and I had more energy than I knew what to do with. I could not remember a time when I felt better. I started to look healthier and slept better. I enjoyed exercising and my digestion improved. I was so inspired by the health results I was experiencing that I felt compelled to learn more about the inner workings of the human body nutrition, and the diet health connection. 
I really wanted to immerse myself in learning as much as I could, so I earned a second undergraduate degree in biology and received doctorate-level education in naturopathic medicine and chiropractic, which helped me put everything that I observed into perspective on a much deeper level. And over the years, I've refined my approach to raw food and tailored it to my individual needs, and we can show you how to do this too. So this brings us to our topics of this webinar. Now let's talk about important minerals, prebiotics, and omega-3 fats. And what we cover here is just a minute sampling of the content we teach, which gives you an idea of the depth and breadth of the topics covered in our classes. Our first educational topic for this webinar is going to be a quick look at essential fats with particular emphasis on omega-3 conversion. A lot of you have probably heard about the importance of omega-3 fats in our diets and in our bodies, and a lot of you have probably also heard the claim that if you're on a completely plant-based diet, in other words, you don't consume cold water fish or you don't take fish oil supplements or special types of algae supplements, that you are not going to have enough quantity of all of the right omega-3 fats that do so many important things in our body. So we're going to take a look to see if that's actually true or not by taking a look at omega-3 conversion. Now to start with, let's take a look at what a fat is. Fat is made out of fatty acids, and here we have one right on the screen. We can see that this fatty acid is made out of a central chain of carbons. That's what the C's here represent. Each one of these dashes in between the carbons and in between the carbons and hydrogens represents one or more electrons that share a pathway with two neighbors and the electrons are traveling at the speed of light, so they keep things connected together. Over at the right-hand side of this fatty acid is the acid group, and the opposite side of the acid group is known as the omega group. So let's take a quick look at a different type of fat down below because there's all different types of fats. Now in this fatty acid down below, we see a different situation here. We see two dashes here, and that is actually called a double bond. And you'll see that we're actually missing some hydrogens now. And the reason for that is because those electrons that used to be part of the carbon that could be available to bind to these hydrogens, they're now up in this double bond, so they're not available to bind to these hydrogens anymore, and we're missing hydrogens. Now this fat, this fatty acid, is curved because these hydrogens all have the same charge. And if you've ever tried to put two magnets together with the same charge, you'll find that when you get them closer together, they repel each other more than when they are further apart. So these two hydrogens on top of the double bond are repelling each other more than the ones below the double bond because we're missing a couple hydrogens and the two remaining are further apart, that makes this molecule curve down. So every time you add a double bond, the fat becomes curved. And we can look at the formula over here of this fat, 18, 1. 18 tells you how many carbons are there. 1 tells you how many double bonds are there. But if that's all you know, you don't know where the double bond is. This is an omega-9 fat, also known as monounsaturated because there's one double bond, because from the omega end of the fat, also known as the non-acid end of the fat, this is carbon number one, number two, number three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That double bond is after carbon number nine from the omega end. It's called an omega-9. This fat up above, its formula is 18-0. It has no double bonds. It's known as a saturated fat because the central carbon chain is saturated with hydrogens. This one is unsaturated because the central carbon chain is missing some hydrogens. 
Now, if we take a look at a couple of other fats, here is the omega-6 essential fat, meaning it does important things in the body, but our body doesn't make it, so it's essential that we eat it. It is part of the omega-6 family, because starting from the omega end, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. The first double bond is after carbon number six. It's called an omega-6. We can see now that with two double bonds, it's more curved than the previous fat with one double bond. Then we've got the omega-3 essential fat because the first double bond is after carbon number three. And because this has three double bonds, it's even more curved and arced than the previous fat with two double bonds. And you can see we can fit our logo underneath it. Now, looking at some of the other important members of the omega-3 family, here's one called EPA. It's known as icosopentaenoic acid. And I'll bet a lot of you have heard about EPA, particularly in the discussion about the benefits of fish oil. It's a little longer now. It's got 20 carbons in its chain, and it has five double bonds. First double bond being after carbon number three from the omega end. And you can see compared to alpha linolenic acid with three double bonds, EPA with five double bonds is more arced and we can fit our logo underneath there even more easily. The other significant member of the omega-3 family is known as DHA also found in cold water fish and fish oil. It's even longer now. It has 22 carbons, and it has six double bonds. And we can't fit the logo underneath there anymore because the two sides come and almost touch each other. Those double bonds make this fat curved and fluid and flexible, and the extra electrons in the double bonds can conduct electrical activity. So DHA is a fat very important for our brain cells, for example, for neurons, because there's a lot of electrical activity to make our neurons communicate with each other properly to make our brain function properly. So let's take a look then at the omega-3 family of fats up above the line here and the omega-6 family of fats. Now here is the basic dilemma, if you will, or, or challenge. EPA is very important stuff. In a nutshell, it helps keep inflammation in the body in check. And we do not want too much inflammation because inflammation is thought to be at the root cause of many different types of disease processes. Inflammation in our arteries and our blood vessels makes them more likely to get clogged up, leading to things like heart attacks and strokes and impotence and claudication and kidney disease and other issues that we could all do without. DHA, we mentioned, is very important for the brain. And because DHA incorporates itself into the phospholipid bilayer of our cell membranes to help them conduct electrical activity, there are hormone receptors embedded within the fatty layer of those cell membranes, and DHA helps those hormone receptors to work properly. Things like the insulin receptor, the estrogen receptor, the serotonin receptors, and you want to make sure that's working well, otherwise you could end up with depression. And who wants to deal with that? Now here's the challenge. EPA and DHA are not found in fruits and vegetables, or in leafy greens, or in flax seeds, or chia seeds, or hemp seeds, or walnuts, or any of those. They are found in cold water algae, and most people are not consuming that regularly. And then the krill eat the little algae, and then the little fish eat the krill, and then the medium fish eat the little fish, and the big fish eat the medium fish, and on and on up the food chain. And that's why those cold water fish contain EPA and DHA. That is the major source of these two fatty acids from human or for human beings. Now, ALA, 
alpha linolenic acid, the omega-3 essential fat, is found in foods like leafy green vegetables. And if you eat meaningful quantities, like a, you know, a head or two of greens per day, you can get more than enough of this omega-3 essential fat. It's found also in other vegetables and fruit, if you eat those in enough abundance. But then the most concentrated sources are flax seeds, chia seeds, and walnuts. But flax and chia are the real leaders in omega-3s. So what happens then is your body takes this stuff called ALA, and it needs to go through a process, a series that we can see here, and convert it into EPA, and then finally into DHA. And there have been many, many studies out in the peer-reviewed literature that have shown that when you give people extra ALA, there is not necessarily very much, or sometimes there's no increase at all in DHA levels. And the conclusion then is the body does not convert ALA into DHA very effectively. Well, there are some reasons for that that it says down below, the major reason being that most people are eating too many omega-6 fats. So to get a little technical like we did before, let's take a look at this fat here, this omega-6 essential fat found in most abundance in corn, cottonseed, and soybean oil, so found in processed foods that are staples in most people's diets, including most people who participate in these conversion studies because they're living in the modern world near major universities that are conducting these studies and reporting them in the literature. It's got 18 carbons and two double bonds. Now, as we go down the line, we end up with 22 carbons instead of 18, and we end up with five double bonds instead of two. So this series of enzymes added double bonds and added carbons to make the fats longer and less saturated as we go along. Similarly, in the omega-3 family, we start out with 18 carbons and three double bonds, and by the time we get down to the end of the line, to DHA, we've got 22 carbons instead of 18, and we've got six double bonds instead of three. It's the same set of enzymes that adds double bonds and adds carbons to make these fats longer and less saturated as we go down the line. And as it turns out, when most people consume way more omega-6 fats compared to omega-3 fats, those enzymes are so busy working on the omega-6s, they don't have the opportunity to work on the omega-3s. In addition to that, you do not get enough of the anti-inflammatory omega-3 fat EPA. You end up with excessive amounts of the pro-inflammatory fat AA, also known as arachidonic acid, and so you've got too much inflammation and you inhibit omega-3 conversion. This is fat number one, number two, and number three. So in particular, we're going to look at the conversion of ALA number one into DHA number three. And here's, here are some of the things you may have read out there on the internet. You may have read that DHA is a long chain omega-3 fatty acids that performs many important functions like having our brain work right and regulating hormones. So that's true. You may have also read the major source of DHA is from cold water fish. So vegans who don't eat fish or fish oil do not have a reliable source of DHA and intake is very low or maybe nil. That is true. Vegans have to rely on the conversion of ALA into DHA, just like I just mentioned. So that one is true also. Many studies have shown the human body is inefficient at making that conversion that is true, like I mentioned. So then they make the leap and say vegans are therefore deficient in DHA and their health is suffering as a result, you silly vegans. And they're usually not nearly that polite about it. 
Well, in my clinical experience, where I have had the opportunity in my consulting practice to work with many long-term raw food vegans, I have 28 case histories where I have examined the fatty acid profile in the bodies of raw food vegans. And about 25 of those 28 have very solid DHA levels without ever having an outside source of DHA. Okay, most researchers and most clinicians don't have access to long-term raw food vegans. I feel very fortunate to, to have that access because raw food vegans seek me out because I am a raw food vegan 30 years in at this point, and I love studying lab work and helping people make sense out of it and helping people be on the healthiest raw food vegan diet they possibly can be. Fortunately, I'm not alone here. So let's take a quick look at a study done in the UK back in 2010, just a few years ago. So here we have different groups. We can see fish eaters, and among the fish eaters, or among the non fish eaters, there's meat eaters, vegetarians, and vegans. So here is omega 3 fat number one. Okay, this guy here, ALA. Here is the dietary intake. And the vegans are a little bit lower, but everyone's got a roughly similar amount. Now, by the way, they're not all doing that great because the dietary reference intake put out by the Institute of Medicine in the United States says women should shoot for 1.1 grams per day and men should shoot for 1.6 grams per day. In analyzing many different raw vegan diets, as long as they contain meaningful amounts of leafy green vegetables, they've got typically 2 to 3 grams of ALA per day. So these weren't raw food vegans in this in this group here, they were a little bit lacking. But nevertheless, here's what we have for ALA intake for the different groups, and girls in pink and boys in blue. Now here we have DHA dietary intake. Okay, fat number three, DHA here, brain and hormones. And what we see is that not surprisingly, it's pretty high in the fish eaters, it's, there's barely any in the meat eaters, a sliver in the vegetarians, and none in the vegans. So you put this together and this together with the studies that show the body does not convert this into this very well. Therefore, we would expect very low levels of DHA to be in vegans. But luckily, they actually measured the DHA levels in the bodies of vegans. And look what they found they found levels about similar to the other groups. Actually, the vegan women were the highest. The vegan men were a little bit lower, but averaged out, that's about the same. So the big question is then, how did DHA get in the bodies of these vegans if they had no outside source? The only explanation is that they converted ALA into DHA. And that has also been my clinical experience, and I'm really happy to report that. Occasionally, that's not the case, and then we need to figure out what to do in order to get their body to convert better. And on a rare occasion, despite somebody's best efforts, that does not happen, and then we can utilize an algae supplement if absolutely necessary, and there's not necessarily anything wrong with that. So we've got the party line and it's repeated over and over and over again on the internet. There's a lot of anti-vegetarian rhetoric and propaganda out there. And unfortunately, within the vegetarian and the raw food communities, there's also a lot of rhetoric that is not necessarily true. People buy these programs about how to make a living doing, uh, you know, doing what you love in the natural health movement. And those programs say you don't have to have any experience in the natural health movement, just look stuff up on the internet, and then give your followers your take on that, and let people follow you and, and watch you make all your mistakes. On the one hand, that's entertaining, and it's kind of interesting, but it's not the best way to learn the healthiest approaches uh, to raw food vegan nutrition. So in any case, what I say here for that vegans are deficient in DHA is to not 
believe the hype because it may be true in a few isolated cases, but it is not true as a whole. That UK study found that, and my clinical experience has also found that, looking at actual raw food vegans, not just relying on somebody else's opinion. I hope this has given you some useful information about omega-3 conversion in vegans, and it makes some sense. And hopefully this has given you a little bit more confidence that a properly implemented raw vegan diet can cover all of your nutritional needs and can be extremely healthful, but it has to be done in a way that makes the most sense. So thanks for tuning in, and then we'll continue on with the rest of the webinar. Our next section is the importance of leafy greens, because invariably, when one hears about a raw, vegan, or plant-based diet, certain questions come up, especially the where do you get your questions, including where do you get your calcium, iron, zinc, and so forth. So to illustrate for you where you can find these minerals, I'll share with you nutrient analyses of two separate raw food menus. So in this first menu, we have, for breakfast, one whole watermelon that weighs 2,880 grams, so a good-sized one. For a mid-morning snack, we have three Valencia oranges. For lunch, we have eight bananas and one and a half cups of blueberries. For an afternoon snack, we have 13 apricots and seven fresh figs. For dinner, we have a salad with one and a quarter cups of chopped tomatoes and five cups of chopped romaine lettuce. This is equivalent to eight leaves. With a salad dressing made from the juice of one lemon and the flesh of one mango. As far as minerals go, we have 703 milligrams of calcium, 15 milligrams of iron, and 6.2 milligrams of zinc. If we compare these numbers to the adult daily values for these minerals, we see that 703 milligrams of calcium does not meet the daily values of 1,000 milligrams for someone between the ages of 19 and 50, and 1,200 milligrams for someone over the age of 50. If we compare the iron value of 15 milligrams to the adult daily values, we find that the daily value has been met for men and postmenopausal women but not premenopausal women. For zinc, 6.2 milligrams does not meet the daily value for women or men. It's important to note that this menu plan is for 2,500 calories, so I would like to see these mineral values much higher than we see here. Additionally, I included the fiber content of this menu plan since we will be discussing fiber shortly. 80 grams of fiber is excellent and not surprising for a whole food, raw food menu based on fruits and vegetables. So how can we improve the mineral content of this menu? To increase the mineral content, we'll add 8 leaves of romaine lettuce to lunch, 14 leaves of romaine lettuce to dinner, which when added to the 8 leaves we already had on the previous menu plan, gives us one large head of lettuce. We'll also add four cups of arugula to dinner. In order to maintain a similar number of calories, we'll subtract one banana. So let's take a look at our updated menu plan with the additions and subtractions we just talked about. So breakfast and our mid-morning snack have not changed from the previous menu. We subtracted one banana from lunch and added five cups of chopped romaine lettuce. If you remember, lunch on our previous menu plan did not contain any leafy greens. Our afternoon snack has not changed from the previous menu plan. For dinner, we increased the amount of romaine lettuce from eight leaves to one large head of romaine and have added four cups of chopped arugula. Our salad dressing has not changed. So let's see how much of a difference these leafy greens made in the mineral content of the menu. On this menu plan, as you can see, the amounts of calcium, iron, and zinc have increased. We now have met the calcium daily value for someone between the ages of 19 and 50, and we have achieved the iron daily value for men, 
premenopausal and postmenopausal women. The addition of the leafy greens has also increased the zinc content of the first menu plan. Fiber content has also increased, which is not surprising, since leafy greens are a rich source of fiber. So, for a similar number of calories, this menu plan is much higher in these important minerals. And just so you know, these menu plans are not suggested or recommended menu plans. I just use them to illustrate the important role that leafy greens can play in increasing the mineral content of a raw food diet. Arugula and romaine lettuce are just two examples of leafy greens that can be used. There are many others too, like dandelion greens, kale, bok choy, and others. Some leafy greens are not a great source of minerals because they contain substances called oxalates that bind to calcium, iron, and zinc and make these minerals less available to the body. These leafy greens include spinach, Swiss chard, beet greens, parsley, and purslane. These are not bad foods, they're just not a great source of these minerals when they are raw. So the ones that I mentioned earlier dandelion greens, bok choy, kale, arugula, lettuce, those foods are much lower in oxalate, and those are going to be a better source of these important minerals. Now getting back to fiber, there are different types of fiber, two being cellulose and prebiotic fiber. Cellulose is referred to as roughage for its role in helping to maintain digestive system regularity. And then there's prebiotic fiber, also referred to by the term prebiotic or prebiotics. Now, what are prebiotics? Before we answer this question, let's talk a little bit about probiotics. Probiotics are a really hot topic in the health community. And essentially, probiotics are living organisms that can confer health benefits for the host when used in adequate or appropriate amounts. Essentially, they are beneficial microorganisms that live in our digestive tract. The most popular ones would include Lactobacillus acidophilus and Bifidobacterium bifidum. Now, there are many others, but I mention these because these are among some of the most well-known. Now, there's been a lot of talk about probiotics that we take in supplemental form, not living very long in our digestive tract. So how can we help these beneficial organisms stay in our digestive tract longer? Providing them with food is a really good start. So what kind of food do these probiotics consume? Do they eat the same food as we do? Like burgers and fries on the standard Western diet? As it turns out, probiotics like fiber. And fiber is not digestible by us, but it is usable by probiotic bacteria. Probiotics like special types of fiber, two of which are fructooligosaccharide, also known as FOS, and inulin. You may have seen either of these or both on your probiotic label. And there are others too. Because fructooligosaccharide and inulin provide food for probiotics, they're called prebiotics. So essentially, prebiotics are food for probiotics. Now when you feed probiotics their favorite food, they tend to stick around. So Where do we find fructooligosaccharides and inulin? Fructooligosaccharides and inulin are found in more than 36,000 plant species. In other words, a variety of fruits and vegetables. Now, if you're eating a whole food plant-based diet, you're likely getting a decent amount of these prebiotics in your daily diet. But if you want to provide super rich sources of prebiotics to your probiotics, you can look to bananas, Jerusalem artichokes, dandelion greens, and the other foods that we have listed up here on this slide. For example, if we take a closer look at bananas, dandelion greens, and Jerusalem artichokes, we find that seven bananas 
provides 6 grams of inulin and fructooligosaccharide. Now, in order to achieve that same amount of these two prebiotics, we would need one cup of chopped dandelion greens or one quarter cup of chopped Jerusalem artichokes. So as you can see, you can get a fair amount of these important prebiotics from these foods. Now, I realize that not everybody is going to consume seven bananas. But for example, if we take two bananas, in those two bananas, we have about 1.5 grams of fructooligosaccharides and inulin. Now, people have asked in the past, is there a recommended dietary allowance for prebiotics, such as fructooligosaccharides and inulin? As of now, there's no recommended dietary allowance for them. But a number of sources have suggested 4 to 8 grams of prebiotics for general digestive health. Now, I can use myself as an example. I eat a high raw plant-based diet and I get almost 5 grams of fructooligosaccharides and inulin per day. And that's from eating a variety of fruits and vegetables, some nuts and seeds, and this doesn't include these high prebiotic foods. Now, if I added just two bananas and one cup of chopped dandelion greens to my daily diet, I would get a total of 13 grams of these prebiotics. So that's five grams of these prebiotics from a mostly raw diet based on fruits and vegetables and eight grams of prebiotics from the two bananas and the one cup of chopped dandelions alone. So as you can see, bananas and dandelion greens can add a significant amount of these important prebiotics to one's diet. So what's the bottom line with all of this? If you're eating a diet based on fruits and vegetables, you're likely getting a notable amount of fiber, such as we discussed earlier in the importance of greens section of this talk. Additionally, you're providing the probiotics in your digestive tract their preferred source of food. And if you wanted to add additional prebiotics to your diet, the foods that we talked about that are really rich in these prebiotics would include bananas, Jerusalem artichokes, and dandelion greens. We hope you've enjoyed the information on some of these important minerals and how the right types of leafy green vegetables can help you meet your mineral needs, how prebiotics can support the human microbiome, and our discussion of essential fats with emphasis on omega-3 conversion. As the pie chart shows, there is so much more where this came from. If raw food science explained to you in easy-to-understand terms in a fun format with plenty of time to sink in, a manageable time commitment, and plenty of opportunity to ask questions and get clarification directly from us is important to you, then we invite you to join us for our online Mastering Raw Food Nutrition Interactive and Educator course. Our next course begins in August of 2017, and it's a 12-month course. The time commitment is about two to three hours per week, and approximately two hours per week is of professional quality videos similar to what you saw in the webinar. You can watch these videos on your own schedule at any time, and you can watch them as many times as you want. Along with that, you get a comprehensive set of notes mailed to you, including all the charts and graphs that you see on the PowerPoints. Now, these notes are not just a transcript of our lectures written out in paragraph form. They are well thought out and designed to go along with the lectures. They have bullet points, like I said before, charts and graphs, and our students have been telling us for over a decade now that they love having these notes, and they will be a reference point, reference material for them forever, even many years after this course is over.
In addition to that, we have about one hour live weekly question and answer sessions via the internet or the phone. This is where you get direct interaction with us in real time every week. We really love connecting with our students, and that's why we offer these weekly sessions. I remember years ago taking a 30-day self-empowerment program back in the days when they had cassette tapes. So I bought all the cassette tapes and I listened to them in my car. And I remember starting the day two cassette and the guy said, congratulations, you made it to day two. And I believe he said you, we were ahead of, you know, 80% or so of the people who buy various programs because most of the time people just buy programs and they don't take them. They don't actually follow through. With the weekly calls, we will be there with you every week to answer questions you have about that week's content and make sense out of it. If you know the weekly calls are coming up, you are so much more likely to watch the videos for that week and then participate with us and your fellow students in order to get even more clarification about the material. Now, if you will occasionally miss a call, for example, but you would still like to have your questions answered, we've got an easy format set up where you can type in your questions ahead of time. Then we'll answer the questions during the call, and then you can listen to the recording of the call afterwards and hear the answers to your questions. As far as our interest in connecting with students and answering their questions, here are a few comments from our previous Science of Raw Food Nutrition students. And like we said, the Science of Raw Food Nutrition is the foundation for our new, expanded, upgraded, mastering raw food nutrition curriculum. One student said, the real strength of this course is the willingness of both presenters to engage students and respond to questions. Keep it up. Another student said, thank you for your extreme efforts to reach the non-nerds. You were very organized and I never worried that I would not have my questions answered. This was very professional and respectful of all levels of previous knowledge. Another student said, I thoroughly enjoyed this class. There was a high level of information delivered by qualified instructors. I've absorbed an amazing amount of information, but the doctor's Dina delivered it in a very efficient and accessible way, so I never felt swamped. They willingly made themselves available for questions, and no question was too unimportant for them to answer. Thank you. We're offering our class in this manner because many people told us they do not follow through with self-paced courses, which we refer to as the abandonment model. Some other courses that we've seen offer instructor interaction only one time per month. And then the most extreme thing we saw was that we saw a course that was you, you pay money to get a piece of paper with a syllabus on it that tells you what to go read. And then once you read that stuff, you take a test and then you're certified. You know, you take a multiple choice test. That seemed ridiculous. And that's not the way we do it. We stay with you the whole way. Our program is very cohesive. You get all of the pieces of the puzzle. You get to understand what makes those pieces tick and how they work. And then you get to see how they all work together synergistically. Now, in other programs, you do oftentimes get exposed to the work of different educators, sometimes live, in other cases by video, or lessons that are prepared ahead of time. Now, on the one hand, it's great to be exposed to different perspectives and different points of view. But on the other hand, all the different people you hear from in these programs have not gotten together to weave their points of view into a cohesive whole. In our case, we expose you to lots of different sources of information, but because there's two of us and we're a married couple who are both super enthused about raw food nutrition and we talk to each other about this stuff all the time, we're able to put everything into perspective so you're left with how to integrate these different ideas for maximum benefit instead of being left confused. Now, we appreciate that one of our previous students said that we go out of our way to reach the non-nerds, but we have to admit, we're pretty nerdy. 
when we're eating dinner, when we're driving down to buy our wholesale produce cases and get a carload of stuff, when we go out walking, sometimes even when we're laying in bed before we go to sleep, we talk about raw food nutrition and science and how all of this stuff works together, and we're very, very cohesive about it. Building on that, we, to our knowledge, we are the only dual doctorate degree couple in the raw food community. So we have the synergy of two very well-educated, very well-researched, time-tested perspectives. So you get a lot of exposure to lots of different things, but at the same time, it's not confusing. It all comes together cohesively in a way that you've got a solid foundation to plug it all into so it all makes sense. Another previous student named Barbara from Colorado said that this extraordinary course is loaded with the most cutting-edge, unbiased, scientific, peer-based research, along with the essential fundamentals of nutrition. The instructors, Dr. Rick and Dr. Karen Dina, are brilliant, dedicated, and passionately driven to make a difference and transform people's lives. I have been an insulin-dependent diabetic for 20 years. I now feel enlightened and empowered with the knowledge from this class to live a life filled with health, vitality, and longevity. Now, we've got 50 weeks worth of material over the course of the year. And like we said, there's about two hours of videos that you can watch on your own schedule as many times as you want each week. And that provides about 100 hours worth of solid content. Now, please keep in mind that 100 hours from us is probably more like 500 or so hours elsewhere. We can't stand wasting time. We like to be thorough, but we're, we don't like to be repetitive or waste anybody's time. We value your time as much as we value our own, and our commitment to you is to make the best use of your time. Many of our students have shared in this, and they've told us that they have taken other courses previously and have been amazed at how much they learned in a short amount of time. Here's a couple of quotes from previous students who took just the first 12 hours of our curriculum. One student said, I've gotten more from these two days than I got in a year at the well-known nutrition program. Of course, they didn't give the name. I'm looking forward to the next segment. Another student said, the sheer quantity and quality of information packed into two days by extremely knowledgeable and professional presenters was outstanding. And Gail from Massachusetts says, I, who took our entire curriculum, said, I really enjoyed the course and wouldn't know where I could find the wealth of material breadth of information, and detailed and cleared explanations anywhere else and as efficiently presented as Dr. Rick and Karen's excellent program. Thank you again with a smiley face. <laughs> One other student said Dr. Rick and Dr. Karen presented complex information in a clear and concise manner. It is a wonderful opportunity for those who do not have a background in biochemistry or nutrition. Highly recommended. We also have an educator component of the course where you can learn how to teach other people about this information. And even for those of you who don't want to necessarily go out and make a career or any type of formal situation about educating other people, the fact is when you start eating a plant-based, a vegan, or a raw diet, you, you take on the role of an educator. You will get questions when people see you eat, and we'll teach you how to answer them. Not just what to say, but how to say it in a way that creates rapport. This will allow you to feel more comfortable eating a raw food diet and will help you be a positive influence on others, which may even allow you to gain some allies and supporters. That's really helpful when you're on a path that's different than a lot of what the rest of the world is doing. Additionally, when you have this solid foundation, you're so much less likely to be led off track by people who are not well-educated about nutrition. 
but they often think they are. So you won't be influenced by those that tell you you're not going to get enough protein or calcium or iron or B12 or vitamin D or omega-3s or, or all these other things eating a raw vegan diet. You'll be unknockable, if you will, and you will be undeterred because you will have such a solid foundation and education to work from. Here's a previous student who said, I like that I will now be able to express my lifestyle to worried friends. Another student said, I recommend this course to anyone wanting to gain knowledge about the science of raw food. Doctors Rick and Karen really empowered me and gave me the confidence I needed to share this valuable information with my friends, my family, and anyone that is curious. Thank you so much for an amazing course. And to get to a few comments from our current Mastering Raw Food Nutrition online students, at the end of April of 2017, we received an email totally unsolicited from a current student, and the subject line was sharing a great experience. And here's what she said, Drs. Rick and Karen, I had the most amazing experience yesterday evening and today. I'm in Monaco on business, and I had meetings with four business people. It started yesterday evening as I started my diatribe about nutrition. I started in reaction to a comment over dinner from one woman who referred to the fact that her husband ate lots of eggs and meat because he is a bodybuilder, and she went on to share several more details that we're going to skip over. She said then the next morning at another meeting, they wanted more. And after explaining in some detail how the wrong mix of fat makes the structure of cells stiff and rigid, resulting in resistance for hormones, insulin, and serotonin, and the further consequences of each of those things, and how too many omega-6s causes inflammation in our bodies resulting in various disease processes, I went on to calorie optimization overall and why overeating is bad, having too many free radicals and not enough antioxidants is bad, and why a meat and egg diet is deficient in vitamins, phytonutrients, and fiber. We talked about satiety, and I shared how excess weight can cause dysfunctions in the hormones controlling satiety. I was on a roll, and everyone in the meeting listened with pure fascination. I must admit, I was also listening to myself with pure fascination. They were all just like I was before I started the course. They did not know even the fundamentals of nutrition. How is it possible that so many well-educated people know so little about nutrition? Knowledge is power, and I felt totally empowered today. Thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. She summarized by saying, I have never been as interested in any learning experience in my entire life, and I am simply bursting with enthusiasm and passion. You have changed my life forever. Now, this really was one of those situations where it made us realize, that it just reinforced for us so much that this is why we do what we do. We love making these kinds of differences in people's lives. So in this student's case, instead of feeling weird or like an outcast for eating differently, she ended up taking a leadership role in the conversation and got other students interested in healthy eating. And at that point in the course, we had not even gotten to the educator portion of the course. Just from what she had learned already, she was able to take that leadership type of role. And, and it, we're just so happy about that. Another one of our current students said, I find it very helpful to have the point of view of doctors who are really impartial in their opinions and who explain things with scientific studies and fact, not just philosophical thoughts, and who do not sell anything. To make a quick comment about that, going back to the take and wake model I discussed earlier in the webinar, we have so many examples of salespeople masquerading as health gurus. And when they're trying to sell you something, they can't be fully objective. It's one of the big problems. So it was nice of her to acknowledge that we don't sell anything. She went on to say, I feel very lucky to be able to ask any questions each week and to always receive a good response. I've learned a lot. 
I understand much more now, even though I studied biology and have read a lot of books about raw food before the course. I hope there will be a second year for us to enter even more deeply into the science of raw food. Thanks to you, Drs. Rick and Karen Dina. So, we mentioned before that we do meet the non-nerds and the people without a scientific background where they are and explain all this in ways that they can understand. But here we have a student who, who studied biology, who has a background in that, and is very well educated about raw food nutrition, who actually educates other people about raw food nutrition, and she wants to keep learning more. So our hearts are really touched by that as well. Another one of our current students has said, I've been really impressed with the course, learned a huge amount, and enjoyed it thoroughly. I'm not a raw vegan currently, but I'm certainly eating more raw now. So we don't have judgment about that you have to be in the club or you have to do it one way or the other way. Wherever somebody is, we give them solid, credible information, and the conclusion is so often, if not always, more fruits and vegetables in your diet are beneficial, and no matter what else somebody is doing, that will help them out. So we're happy to see this comment as well. Here we have another current student who said, This course has provided me with a real understanding of metabolism. I feel my feet on a firm ground of understanding of what I'm doing and what I would be doing in eating any sort of diet. So this is similar to the previous testimonial, and it makes the point that no matter what type of diet you eat, learning the facts about nutrition in a thorough and accurate way leads to the conclusion that eating more fruits and vegetables is so beneficial as long as a sensible approach is taken. And it's not all or nothing. So no matter where you are or what you're eating currently, you can benefit from this knowledge. And if you're 100% raw and 100% enthused, this will fuel your fire even more and will reinforce what you are doing well. At the same time, we've had a lot of such students who have been very grateful for the distinctions and improvements they were able to make from taking our class, which greatly increases the likelihood that they'll continue to be successful with it over the long term. Because over our decades of experience, we have seen many people be very enthused about raw food and be very adamant, yet a few years later, they're not keeping it up. Okay, we, we feel like we can help those people and help make distinctions and fine-tune their diets so they will keep it up over the long term. We've been at this about 30 years each, and we want to keep going for much, much longer. We want that for all of you. And then this same student sent us an email a few weeks ago and just happened to mention in the content of the email, she said, I am so enjoying the course. It is all so interesting and makes so much sense. So thank you very, very much. Remember earlier when I told you my story about my decision to try raw food when I was in an energy pit of fatigue? Well, now it's time for you to make a decision. You are watching this webinar because you are interested in plant-based and raw food nutrition and in taking your knowledge to the next level so you can supercharge your health and maintain it for a lifetime. At this point, you already know if you want to learn more from us. This class will only be offered one time this year, and once it fills, it won't be offered again until late summer of 2018 at a higher price. Right now, we're offering this course at a special early bird price for a limited time. As you've heard, our students are so happy with the new online format, and we've noticed a difference too. You can watch the course videos on your own schedule and re-watch them as many times as you would like. This way, you'll have plenty of time for the information to sink in. In addition, you will receive the support of a comprehensive set of notes and weekly question and answer sessions in real time in small groups directly with us. We love connecting with our students and we'll be there with you the whole way. You can access this course anywhere you have an internet connection, which is most places on this planet. 
we'll be sending you an email shortly titled A Raw Food Education Opportunity, where we'll invite you to sign up for a time to speak with us to answer any questions you may have about our curriculum and the structure of the class to help determine if it's a good fit for you. Thank you so much for joining us and have a great night.